Psalm 44 represents a shocking way of talking to God. Now, we might be comfortable with the first eight verses. Uh, the psalmist there recounts fond memories of God's deliverance in verses 1 through 3. He says, we have heard with our own ears what you have done with our fathers, verse 1. They were in trouble, verse 2, and your strength and your smiling grace rescued them, verse 3. He then expresses personal trust in God's provision, verses 4 through 8. He says, you aren't only the God of my fathers, you're my king, verse 4. I don't trust in my strength, I boast in you, and I've known you to deliver, verses 5 through 7. I boast in your name and give thanks to you continually, verse 8. So far, so good. Then the psalm ventures into the less familiar and what at first sounds to us like the area of impiety, a place that we shouldn't go in the way that we talk to God. The writer first vents his frustration over God's inaction, verses 9 through 16. You have let me down, he says. I have become a disgrace because you have failed to help me. He then defends his integrity, verses 17 through 22. The penalty, he says, exceeds the crime. I've been faithful. I've kept covenant with you. Why this treatment? This isn't right the way that you're treating me, God. But perhaps most shockingly, he closes with a call to action to the Almighty, verses 23 through 26. He asks, three strong, reprimanding questions. Questions like, why are you sleeping, God? He makes five insistent demands, like, wake up. So we, we wonder, is this the right way to talk to God? Can I talk to God this way? Should I talk to God this way? Well, to try to answer those questions, let me close with three observations, pastoral observations and, and suggestions about this psalm. First of all, let's realize that this is a psalm for an emergency. This is not the psalmist's ordinary way of talking to God. You can tell that he is in a hard place when he talks to God this way. And I'm so thankful that God doesn't give us psalms with language and vocabulary just for ordinary times, even slightly bad times. He gives us psalms for emergencies, and Psalm 44 is a good place to start when thinking about how to talk to God in an unimaginably hard place. Second, the prayer of Psalm 44 teaches us that there is, in the words of one commentator, an immense mystery in God and his ways, but one must continue to trust and obey. At the beginning of the psalm, you get the sense that the psalmist thought he understood God. He understood his past dealings. He understood their relationship in the present. But then he goes on to reveal, you know what? I don't really understand God the way I thought I did. You will never entirely figure out God, of course, and that's a good thing. But you must wrestle hard to try. And Psalm 44 helps us to do that. Third, a loving parent will listen patiently, empathetically, even when his child, her child, um, pushes hard at the boundaries of respect. And that's what we have here in Psalm 44. We have a loving father listening patiently, empathetically to the lament and even accusations of a frustrated son. Um, and we are able to press God as well because of the work of Jesus on our behalf. Jesus, because of his actual integrity, not his inflated integrity as the psalmist surely betrays here, but his actual integrity, and his endurance of injustice. The penalty did not fit the crime in Jesus' case. There was no crime, but the penalty was extreme. Jesus gives us this 
kind of access to God. Let's listen as we hear uh, this cry for help from Psalm 44. To the choir master, a maskil of the sons of Korah, O God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You, with your own hand, drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For not by their own sword did they win the land, nor did their own arm save them. But your right hand, your arm, the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, ordained salvation for Jacob. Through you we push down our foes. Through your name we tread down those who rise up against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me. But you have saved us from our foes and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. But you have rejected us and disgraced us and have not gone out with our armies. You have made us turn back from the foe and those who hate us have gotten spoil. You have made us like sheep for the slaughter. You've scattered us among the nations. You have sold your people for a trifle, demanding no high price for them. You have made us the taunt of our neighbors, the derision and scorn of those around us. You have made us a byword among the nations, a laughing stock among the peoples. All day long, my disgrace is before me, and shame has covered my face. At the sound of the taunter and reviler, at the sound of the enemy and the avenger. All this has come upon us, though we have not forgotten you. And we have not been false to your covenant. Our heart has not turned back, nor have our steps departed from your way. Yet you have broken us in the place of jackals and covered us with the shadow of death. If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Yet for your sake, we are killed all the day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Awake. Why are you sleeping, O Lord? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? For our soul is bowed down to the dust. Our belly clings to the ground. Rise up. Come to our help. Redeem us for the sake of your steadfast love. Amen.